Okay, so we're going to go ahead and pick up where we left off, talking about ARDS. All right, so my ARDS group, all right, you'll be taking notes. <laughs> um, don't worry, there's, there's so, much to, so much about ARDS uh, that I'm not going to be able to cover um, any of the nuance. I'll leave that to you guys to, to fill in the gaps on uh, Tuesday, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tuesday. Right. Ooh. Okay, so what is ARDS? ARDS is currently stands for acute respiratory distress syndrome. That's not what ARDS was always called, but that's what we currently call this uh, syndrome. So it's a bunch of different things going on. Um, ARDS was originally identified or originally kind of thought about, just move that over a little bit, in World War two and possibly in world war one um, and what what people noticed what the battlefield surgeons noticed is that people that had severe injuries who were who were resuscitated um, and who initially looked like they were resuscitated ended up developing this this syndrome of uh, hypoxemia that wouldn't respond to oxygen and pulmonary edema respiratory distress and progressing to, to respiratory failure and, and uh, death. Mortality rates are incredibly high and actually still are. And because they saw this phenomenon occurring in soldiers who had developed shock from their injuries, the original name for this was shock lung. That was originally what ARDS was, was called. And we have now come to realize that it's not only shock, but it is anything that can cause an insult to the body and can trigger systemic inflammatory changes can cause someone to go into ARDS. So uh, certainly injuries and traumas and toxic inhalation and direct lung injuries can do that, but there are other things that can do, do that as well. A medication reaction, an infection, and not necessarily an infection of the lungs, but an infection somewhere else in the body, right? Um, surgery, uh, toxic exposure, um, overdoses, um, sh different shock states. So anything that can cause an inflammatory response and a lung injury can potentially cause someone to go into ARDS. Um, so it is due to a lung injury that progresses to, and this is important, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema and poorly compliant lungs. All right, so the lungs have very low compliance, like we talked about yesterday. So this is primarily a restrictive disorder, right? The lungs are stiff, and they do not want to inflate. It's very hard to get the lungs to open up. This is non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, okay? So this is pulmonary edema that does, has nothing to do with the heart. It is not the heart failing, although... Cardiogenic shock can cause ARDS. It, can, it could be the insult to cause ARDS. But ARDS as an individual or separate problem is not due to the heart failing. It is due to the lung injury and the loss of normal lung structures and functions that causes fluid to leak into the lungs. Does that, does that kind of make sense? So it's a loss of the integrity of the type 1 and type 2 alveolar pneumocytes. Um, so it tends to follow an insult. So the history of an ARDS patient is there's going to be some sort of insult. Uh, and typically this takes several days to develop. This is not something that happens right away. And you guys may have heard, have you ever heard of the term, of course you have, hopefully, you've heard of the term irreversible shock, right? This is actually part of that whole syndrome of irreversible shock where someone goes into shock and they're, they, they, they pass some physiological threshold, um, but we resuscitate them and it looks like they're doing okay and then over a period of several days, what happens? They, they go into multiple organ failure, right? ARDS is a common finding in patients who die from irreversible shock. Um, it's commonly associated with multiple organ failure, and it's commonly seen in patients with, with septic shock as well. But there's some sort of insult in their history. Infections are common, trauma, periods of hypovolemia, different shock states, surgery, 
and toxic exposure tend to be the, the, the top things that we run into. And how do these patients present? Well, they develop progressive dyspnea and hypoxemia and hypoxia, and this is important, that does not improve with oxygen. Well, doesn't this sound like something if you take this at face value? This kind of sounds like a pulmonary embolism, doesn't it? Somebody has a pulmonary embolism isn't the classic presentation of a, of a hypoxic slash hypoxemic patient that doesn't have a, a robust response to supplemental oxygen. But what differentiates ARDS from pulmonary embolism is ARDS is progressive, right? So it, it uh, progresses over a period of days, whereas pulmonary embolism tends to be what? Very sudden, right? Very acute onset, right? Again, history is really important here. And you may not have pulmonary edema with, uh, with a pulmonary embolism either, all right? Um, the classic thing that we see on the x-ray, when we do an x-ray of someone who has ARDS, they have bilateral whiteout of their lungs. And I believe Art, um, he, taught, he teaches the intro quite a bit. Um, and he talks, and he's actually an x-ray technologist, and um, he should have reviewed some x-rays with yeah, you guys. Up, uh, chest yeah, yeah. Um, so chest x-rays and CT scans of the head are kind of important for, for EMS providers. Um, not that you're going to be required to do in-depth interpretation of radiographic studies, but you still need to be aware of the terminology. But bilateral infiltrates, so basically it looks like the lungs are whited out bilaterally, and the pattern is really weird. It almost looks like someone took sandpaper and sanded the lungs. It's that kind of grainy, granular um, uh, pattern of white, fluffy stuff in their lungs, and that is known as ground glass. So bilateral gl gl ground glass infiltrates on the x-ray is a classic finding of an ARDS patient. All right? This is sometimes mistaken for um, cardiogenic pulmonary edema because somebody's heart fails and fluid backs up in the lungs. It can have a similar appearance. Um, so you kind of have to put everything together. Is there, was there a history of an insult in this patient? How long ago was it? Did they develop progressive dyspnea, hypoxemia that required more and more oxygen and oftentimes intubation, right? And the patient continues to deteriorate even after being intubated and being placed on high, um, high FiO2s, all right? And again, it takes time to develop, days following the insult. Okay, you guys okay at that? So this is not something you're gonna see when you pull somebody out of a vehicle, right? You, this is something you're going to see after the patient has been admitted, and oftentimes you're going to see this in an inter-facility transfer type of situation. Right? You get called up, um, and you're transferring a patient from a smaller, a less specialized outlying facility, and maybe they um, have some sort of orthopedic injury. They stabilize the injury. They get out of surgery. And then they start having this respiratory issues, and they end up having to reintubate them. And then they call you, and they arrange for a transfer of that patient to, to a larger facility to deal with this, this respiratory stuff. This is a common thing that you'll run in. So then, then you get on scene a few days after this insult, and you have this really sick patient with ARDS, and you've got to deal with them. So what's the treatment? Positive pressure ventilation is often required for these patients, right? So we got to be wary of all of the problems attached to positive pressure ventilation. We've talked about those and dealt with them a little bit in the lab. Um, PEEP is going to be a very important component to managing these patients. And remember yesterday in the lab, what basically, what is PEEP basically? It's basically CPAP, isn't it? PEEP is a CPAP for patients who are intubated. And uh, receiving mechanical ventilatory support. And CPAP is generally for non intubated patients. However, you can intubate somebody, and if they are spontaneously breathing and awake and oriented, you can um, actually put them into CPAP. Right? Um, 
but if somebody is that quote unquote stable where they're breathing on their own and they're awake and they're oriented and all they need is um, PEEP slash CPAP, then it's kind of like, well, why do they need to be intubated in the first place? But there could be some, some reasons. Maybe they have a, a airway, right, an airway burn or a tumor or something like that where it's an airway issue. But anyway, PEEP is a very important component to managing patients with ARDS. PEEP is good at, as you guys know, splinting the alveoli open, right? And that increases surface area for gas exchange, right? And it can help improve oxygenation. Okay. Now, we haven't talked about ventilation management or ventilator management in any detail yet, um, but some things that you guys want to be aware of. There are basically two general ways that we can ventilate patients, okay? And we can ventilate them with volume, and we can ventilate them with pressure. Generally speaking, most adult patients are ventilated in what's called volume control ventilation, or VCV. And volume control ventilation is where I tell the ventilator to deliver a tidal volume. So I put in 500 milliliters at a rate of 10, and what does the ventilator do? It delivers uh, 10 breaths a minute, 500 milliliter tidal volume. Does that, that make sense? And that's known as volume control ventilation, okay? That's one of the major types. The other major type is something called pressure control ventilation, okay? And pressure control ventilation, instead of putting in a tidal volume, I set a pressure, and the ventilator delivers a breath until a certain pressure is sensed, and then it terminates that breath. Right? Does that, that make sense? So oftentimes what we do is because these patients are on high PEEP and their lungs are so poorly compliant, it takes you know, large pressures to ventilate those lungs, um, Volume control ventilation can actually be damaging to these patients. So what we'll do is we'll transition to pressure control ventilation to limit the amount of pressure that their lungs are being exposed to. And then if that fails, there are what we call special modes, specialty modes of ventilation. Um, and these include things like airway pressure release ventilation, and even oscillatory ventilation, or high, what we call high-frequency ventilation, um, where you put somebody on an, uh, an oscillating ventilator, and it ventilates them in, uh, you know, hundreds of breaths per minute, really tiny breaths, tiny breaths, 100 breaths, lots of peep, um, really bizarre modes. Uh, these are specialty modes you guys will not typically run into at the level of a, of a of a standard paramedic because they often require highly complicated ventilators to deliver them and those modes are typically beyond what most transport ventilators can do. There are some very very complex and rather expensive transport ventilators that can do things like APRV, airway pressure release ventilation, but oscillatory ventilation um, is actually its own, it's its own ventilator that just does um, oscillatory ventilation. And then there is also something else that is becoming um, a little more popular in, uh, in larger facilities, and this is something called ECMO. Have you guys ever heard of the term ECMO? ECMO stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And it is a modified form of bypass. You guys should be f familiar with the concept of bypass from cardiology. What is bypass? Let's say somebody's having a STEMI and you take them into the cath lab. You're talking about cabbage? There you go, right, and, and, and they, they fail, right? We can't reestablish perfusion with the cath lab. They've got substantial coronary artery disease. Um, well, we might have to take them into the OR and do it. What's a cabbage? It's a coronary artery bypass grafting. Good. So coronary artery bypass and grafting. So basically what we do is we pull veins, typically out of a leg, and then we graft those veins onto the heart 
and we onto the coronary arteries and we bypass those blocked areas on the coronary arteries with uh, generally the saphenous, like the long saphenous vein is used, right? Well, oftentimes that's very difficult to do on a beating heart, right? So what happens in a lot of cases? What do we do to our patients? We stop the heart. We stop the heart right? Yeah, we stop the heart. Well, that generally means you're dead, right? So what do we have to do when the heart is stopped? Yeah, how do we do that? Yeah, yeah, we put big cannulas in their great vessels and we pull blood out of their body, send it through a machine that oxygenates it, and then we put that blood back into their body, and that is known as bypass, right? It's known as bypass, heart-lung bypass. Um, ECMO is a modified form of bypass. It is not full-on bypass, but it is a type of bypass, and it is used to bypass the lungs. And so what we do is we insert large catheters, and we'll insert a large catheter into a, a large vein, in a large artery, right? And what we'll do is we will pull the oxygenated blood out, send it through the ECMO machine, we'll oxygenate that, and then we'll put that blood back into the body and we will bypass the lungs. So basically what, we're, what we have is a lung outside of the body, if you will, that's what ECMO does. And then what we do is we allow the lungs to not do much of anything and that, in some cases, may allow the lungs to heal. It may decrease the inflammation. And then we can get them off of the ECMO at a later point, and they might go on and, and survive. And, and this uh, traditionally has is, is been a pediatric uh, neonatal kind of thing that's been done, but uh, more specialty centers are now doing this on adult patients. Is this something that you guys are going to run into for the most part? No, probably not, because if somebody's getting ECMO, they're probably where they need to be, right? <laughs> they're probably at the facility they need to be at. However, many facilities, many complicated facilities have their own in-house transport teams. So let's say we've got a, a person on ECMO, and for some reason we need to move them to an, another area of the facility. Guess what? You might be on call, right? You... Maybe someday one of you guys in this class will be working at such a facility where you're on one of these teams. So it's certainly not outside of the, the realm of reason. Um, so there you go. Really complicated, really sick. Mortality rates can be as high as 50%, right? Yeah, even with best best treatment. So mortality for, for ARDS can be very high. Um, this is going to be important for my ARDS group. You guys probably already found this, I'm hoping. Um, ARDSnet for additional reading. Um, this they actually have pretty good uh, guidelines that are published um, for managing, assessing ARDS patients. Right? ARDSnet um, they compile a lot of the the um, contemporary data around um, ARDS patients as well. And it's often associated with critically ill patients. How about that? So patients that are in septic shock or have multiple organ dysfunction syndrome or have 